Hi, I'm Paul Jay, and welcome to the Analysis Podcast. Most economists believe we are heading into a deep global depression. Will the economic stimulus packages that are being announced, particularly the American one, which is the largest, deal with the depth of the crisis? Now joining me to talk about this is Tom Ferguson. Tom is a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Thanks for joining us, Tom. Hi, thanks for having me. Look, the question here, it can be answered very straightforwardly. How big is the decline? And not just in the US, but in Europe and the rest of the world. And the answer is, first of all, of course, is that nobody knows. But secondly, that they're much steeper than most people anticipated as this sort of crisis really got rolling in, for example, March. If you take it country by area by area, you get a much better sort of feel for what's going on and how you can indeed be sliding into something like the scale of the Great Depression. I mean, in the U.S., you've watched unemployment soar. It must be something like 20% now. It's going to keep going. The U.S. did, on the face of it, if you figured you need maybe eh, a package equivalent to 10% of the GDP to try to offset that, that's with some qualifications we can come back to, they only did it, as usual, about half size in the end. I think the best analysis of the U.S. package is Lance Taylor's for INET. It's on the website there. Lance Taylor spells out those numbers. Um, the uh, fundamental thing is that eh, there's you know, a fair amount, maybe at the time it seemed about 5 to 6% of GDP might be being handed out in direct relief. That included the small business support program, which people quite, I think, mistakenly took at its word that it would support small business. We know now for sure that it has been perverted uh, by a string of things, probably the intent of the Treasury to begin with, um, but also uh, for sure the way it was handed out through banks. We, there's no doubt at all. You got good reporting uh, by the Intercept and the New York Times on how the process, the, 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 the loan process has been abused uh, and gone to large numbers of the rich. Um, and, and so Lee, 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 Fang, Lee Fang points out in the Intercept, specifically good friends of Donald Trump, and he gives a bunch of examples in a recent article. I wouldn't dispute that, though Trump's got a lot of friends. And so it's like this is the, my I always have problems with this type of inference until um, we can sort of see what the whole thing looks like, which we can't do. Now, we may add that's not an accident. Uh, the both the Democratic and the Republican leadership completely decided on this to go uh, go for Baroque, that is to say, hide in the dark. They took the old laws that were put up for uh, on regulation and reporting for 2008 and 9 and made those even weaker. Um, and that's quite deliberate. In that sense, you know, we're talking more money with even less accountability. And, and it's not a single party. It's just not the Republican Party alone uh, on this. I mean, that, that bill is, I think, just ridiculous in, in that stuff. And I'm hardly alone in that. Let me come back to the sort of main thread. So here's where I come out. Let me just characterize it in qualitative terms. Um, we've thrown a lot of money at the problem, and that made a lot of people think the population as a whole was going to be substantially helped. It's clear that there's some aid in there uh, for people, but probably not nearly enough. Um, and instead, what you've got is most of the cash is going to business. The point of that aid to business was supposed to be to keep people employed. I think it is clear. Just look at the unemployment rate. That's the simplest thing uh, to do here is that, in fact, what they're doing is taking the money and mostly not employing, uh, continuing to employ people. Uh, there are exceptions. I'm not trying to deny this, but uh, the, the evidence, I think, is pretty clear. You get a, a very odd way of looking at this is because a good, a good deal of that package had to do with the Treasury 
providing money to absorb losses that the Federal Reserve would take when it would set up special purpose vehicles. Just read it as an accounting device, uh, if you like. It's still the Fed. Um, to hand out money to, for particular financial sector participants. Well, the commercial paper facility, everybody's talking about how little has been used. Well, that's, you know, that's telling you something. Commercial paper you usually use to finance something you're actually producing, payroll or raw materials or something. And the conclusion, when you look at this, I think you see pretty clearly what's actually happened is the businesses are taking the cash, but they are just fast and rapidly uh, laying people off. Uh, in that sense, we're going to have a real problem here because you haven't got enough relief cash. Uh, direct relief would have been much better, way more money, direct relief. Um, and then people could buy what they needed. You can aid the businesses that way. That's not the way we do business in America, as you know. Um, and so uh, we are sort of digging ourselves into a hole here, not just here, but elsewhere in the UK, in Europe. I have saw all of these sort of business directive problems all show this type of problem. Um, where uh, there's not enough direct relief. Now, in due course, you know, that's going to put people in really nasty positions. They can't eat or they have to work. In that sense, you're going to fuel some of the protests that you've already seen for we must go back to work. Um, that's abetted by a large propaganda campaign that was has been very clear from the very earliest days of this crisis on a multinational basis. Uh, we can talk about that in a minute. But let me finish the thought here. Um, we are creating a situation in the next month or two, six weeks or so, where you're going to see the, the lack of the aid uh, is going to hit a lot of people. And it, it's almost a parody of, say, if you uh, what the Democratic Party has often done in the past. So this, this is, I understand the Democrats are not solely responsible or even principally responsible for this uh, bill, though they did control the House. And I don't think they tried very hard. You're setting up a deadly situation where the Democratic Party claims the leadership, Pelosi and Schumer are claiming they're standing up for most Americans. They are not standing up effectively for most Americans. And of course, the Republicans have no interest in that. This is going to be, this is going to get sticky. Uh, as the true minimal, smaller sizes of the aid packages sink in. That's just by start. There's another point to bring out here, which is, I can hardly believe this, but they did it. That is to say, uh, it, the uh, House Democrats did not stand up on a key point, which is, it's just obvious that state employees at every level uh, are pretty vital in dealing with these coronavirus panics. Even simple things like police, fire, um, uh, and things like that, uh, you've got to keep functioning. Now, the states are taking huge revenue losses, just like the businesses are. Uh, they're losing on their taxes. Uh, now, the aid bills put money in directly for coronavirus expenses that states incurred, but they didn't give them any kind of an offset for the lost tax revenue. Now, that's insane. Now, what I do not understand, and I'm not the only person who can't understand it, uh, is why uh, Pelosi and Schumer ever accepted this and did not make a public issue out of it. I mean, they kept saying, we'll do it in a later bill. I heard that story before the big uh, package passed. Uh, and I knew at the time, I was talking to people down there, a lot of people thought there might not even be another bill. They were wrong about that. That, that thing is, is passed. Uh, but the, um, the point is, is that you're letting your state systems rot out. Uh, here, there, and there, people are actually getting laid off, and things like, and also at the local level, the problem hits not just states but localities. I mean, how crazy is this? Uh, and now you'd say, well, the Democrats didn't have the strength to force the issue in the conference committees between the uh, uh, House and the Senate. 
You know, that, no, nobody even tried very hard. Obama did the same thing back in 2012 when they, again, didn't fund state funding. Democrats have a long history of this. The only sense I can make of this is that they like to encourage the, the state and local employees to just go out and vote, saying, if you don't do it, you'll be blown away. Uh, but I don't for a second believe that they couldn't have done better than they did if they had tried to. It's pretty simple. The business demand for relief at that point was very intense. You know, when the conservative Senate Republicans momentarily held the bill, there was a literal stock market meltdown. Uh, the Democrats should have just said, look, we're all for this. We'll go along with some kind of relief, but we want that they're going to have to do it for the states and localities, too. They didn't. Uh, I, I think it's a, a huge uh, abuse, frankly. It's just ridiculous. Let's return to your first point. It, it seems to me, then, that what's beginning or entering into is a kind of death spiral. You get a situation where there's less and less, dramatically less consumer demand and loaning money to these businesses, especially when they're using it just to deal with already existing debt, some of which, a lot of which was incurred just to do stock buybacks and other kinds of non-productive and parasitical investment. Um, so you get a situation where they're trying to get the economy going again, but you need consumers to buy stuff to get the economy going again. So one, millions of people will still be out of work and not be able to buy stuff. And they're not doing anywhere nearly enough to, as you said, in direct uh, subsidies so people can buy stuff. But, as, but the other thing that's going to happen as people do go back to work, the pressure of so many unemployed people, especially in the non-unionized sector, they're going to go back to jobs at lower wages which means even less consumptive power, purchasing power. And, and, and if that keeps going, don't we then get into what we saw in the 30s, a long sustained depression? Uh, yeah. Roosevelt even talked about this, that loaning money to businesses I, typically I doesn't do it. I disagree. Let's try working this through sort of piece by piece. Um, at the time the COVID-19 uh, thing hit, the U.S. was actually at a relatively high rate of employment. I mean, unemployment had sunk to levels, you know, not seen actually in a generation. Uh, and, you know, it had blown past all these benchmarks uh, that it was not supposed to be able to do. I mean, and people were still coming out uh, of the woodwork taking jobs. Um and, you know, then the th COVID hits. Uh, and, of course, as you exactly as you just suggested, it's running the unemployment rate way up. Now, that is going to hit the general wage level also, as you suggest. Um, that's, that's the first thing there. Yeah, and it's going to drop wages in general. On the other hand, there are going to be some offsets. Uh, you can be sure that food workers, workers directly in the production of food uh, and some transportation in some places and things are absolutely essential. Like, you know, in other words, public transit in cities, the folks who uh, actually get food from farms to um, your supermarket, those jobs are all much more dangerous than they were. Um, and you're actually seeing a pretty interesting development that gets no publicity. There's something like 120 wildcat strikes uh, that people have recognized. The place to look is Mike Elk's uh, payday uh, website, uh, where he's been trying to tabulate them. Um, and you've got quite a resistance to people just getting killed. And the whole discussion of going back to work is more than a little perverse. Let me just sketch this because it's, it's extremely interesting. From the very earliest moments as the uh, COVID virus hit, actually when it hit first in Italy, you had European industrialists openly saying, you know, we really can't shut our economies down. That would be ruinous. There was one German economist 
uh, who was walking around saying, you know, if we had to do this for more than three months, it would be the end uh, of everything, et cetera. Um, that, th those views were very uh, popular all over in business communities everywhere. Where they were most popular, though, and where they got almost unchecked sway was in the most laissez-faire economies, uh, which means, you know, the UK and the US, bluntly. And the US and the UK were very slow to move. Now, when the Imperial College estimate of deaths was published, it hit both the US and the UK uh, with the sort of force of a thunderclap. And the UK gradually changed policy. And so the US has been very haltingly doing it. Um, now, if, if what you actually have here is bluntly a bunch of white collar people largely advising blue collar people to go back to work because the white collar guys can mostly work at home. Not everybody can. Uh, you know, there are obvious exceptions to that, but the general rule is pretty clear. Um, then you have some important sectoral differences. Um, you could see, for example, the whole medical community in both the US, the UK, and elsewhere really upset about this. You know, they had to deal with all these sick people, and they weren't prepared to deal with it either. But their interest in sort of like actually getting uh, what would actually work to slow this, because it's absolutely, oh, it, it was threatening to overwhelm hospitals and the whole medical complexes of, of every country for a while. You, there was some pretty strong pushback on that, and there still is. Um, and you can see this breaking down. It's going, you know, the more laissez-faire types in most countries want to open immediately or, or sooner, uh, at least in part. That's true in Austria. It's There have been a lot of voices in Germany. So we, we get to the U.S., uh, and, you know, you've seen all this played out in which uh, you get, in effect, Republican leaders saying, uh, let's go back to work now. And Democrats, a good deal more uh, cautious about it. So, Tom, one of the big issues in terms of getting economies going and people back to work is how are health authorities going to know who's sick and who isn't? And one of the things being talked about is a some kind of contact tracing system. So how effective is that? What are the problems with that? Well, Paul, there, there are actually a couple of ways people suggested besides slightly trying to restructure the way, for instance, you go into a shop with numbers of people, stuff that's specific to this enterprise. Um, one of them uh, is a lot of testing, either for antibodies or tests to see, that, in other words, that you had the disease or uh, whether you have it now. The difficulty with those tests uh, is that all of them seem to have many false positives and false negatives. That leads very quickly to the question, okay, what are you gonna do if you've got people wandering around that you haven't caught, your tests haven't shown have the disease, but they have it? Uh, or you know, you've got people who you claim have the disease who don't. Um, Nobody has a real good answer to that question, but the suggestion has been so-called contact tracing for people who've been uh, proven to have actually caught the disease. And the suggestion is use a cell phone uh, to do it, and the cell phone schemes come in two varieties. One is highly centralized, uh, where effectively you are uh, putting an app on your cell phone, which keeps a record of everything and everybody uh, that you came into contact with. A lot of that stuff works through Bluetooth, though that's not the only way to do it. The other system is uh, not centralized and deliberately anonymized. So you can't tell who or what. Uh, nobody can get a bird's eye view of everybody you come into contact with. Instead, your app would send a message to everybody that you came into contact with that you had been uh, found to have the disease. That would warn them. Now, Google and Apple have collaborated to design that decentralized system. There were a variety of schemes for centralized systems. Australia is implementing one right now. Um, the UK, Norway, 
and France are all going for centralized systems, Germany, Italy, and other countries are opting for decentralized. The, the issue here is privacy, uh, whether you're going to have any at all. Um, and it's just uh, basic that if somebody has a centralized record of everything, you, everybody you met, every place you went, uh, well, who's, who's going to control that? Now, the control issue has two aspects. One is a very simple one is who's going to track you. But the other is once they've got you like that, you could, for instance, turn this into a vast amount of useful medical data or other data. Um, and so the question of the ownership of that data is huge. It's perfectly obvious that while governments are talking uh, about, well, maybe they'll control it or something, the companies are hoping to control it, the ones with the centralized systems. This is an issue that's going to get very sticky very fast. It's already happening, as I mentioned. Um, there is a final aspect to this, too, uh, which is never mind whether you are willing to put an app on your phone that would track you. Your employer may require it. And this is clearly uh, an issue that's coming up like a full moon with major implications. Because if people, they're being told they can only go to work with a highly centralized system that can track them. Um, and that obviously the employer there, no question who's going to have access to that data. This is clearly going to be the end of a lot of privacy as we have ever known it. It is likely, I think, a near certainty it'll be abused small questions about worker organization or even just the simple problem of um, do you have to answer the phone at four in the morning if your employer calls you or something like that. It's all going to have to be redone. This is really big stuff and it's very, very important. Is there an alternative? Well, the decentralized systems would at least preserve you from any single person knowing or any single place concentrating all that information because it's not stored anywhere uh, but on your own phone in the Google and Apple system. Um, so, yeah, there are alternatives here, including a lot of people are probably just not going to do it. The question is how much coercion do you want? Um, we'll find out. But what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that the reopening story is a mess. The, the technical prerequisites for that don't really exist, um, nor have we dealt with the safety issues. As I say, the net, the net effects of doing all of this uh, badly mean the health risks are real. Now, what I cannot fathom is why the American unions have been so quiet on this. You know, this, as we are doing this podcast, the news shows uh, in France, a French union won a judgment to tell Amazon it's absolutely got to do better on worker safety. Now, Amazon's responding that it's been trying on worker safety. I, I don't know the particulars of this, so I'm not going to try to pick a favorite there. But it's obvious that in the U.S., you know, with all these wildcat strikes and other complaints that are surfacing, um, you've got a serious problem with worker safety. I mean, and the uh, Environmental Protection Agency is just missing in action. But so, frankly, as far as I can tell, is most of organized labor. I don't understand why they're not running a complaint center, if you like or at least some unions. Some unions have been active. The nursing unions, for example, who are right on the front line, are active. I also, frankly, can't understand. There was a case of, I think his name was Min Lin. He was the first physician fired when he complained. Uh, in some in China. Ago, that his people were not prepared, uh, that they didn't have protective equipment. He was right. fired by a hospital that was owned by a private equity company. This is in uh, Washington State, I think? Yes, yes. Um, and that should have led immediately to demands for whistleblower protection in the law. That should have been in the, uh, the, stimul the second stimulus bill that just passed. Nobody put this up. I, the passivity on the part of, well, I mean, I don't expect the Republican Party to be very interested in this. Uh, but frankly, I would have expected the Democrats to be a little more interested and frankly, with a little more public nudging from labor. I don't get it. 
Tom, let's go back to the beginning again. Yep. If there's if if the issue of the care package is yep. that most of that uh, benefit is going to go to big business and not that much to actually ordinary working families in terms of boosting con- consumption. What should be done for just out of the ridiculous hypothesis that you got a phone call from the White House and whether it's this one or if it's a Biden one, yeah, right. that, what, what that. should they be doing? What does that look like? Uh, OK, what I would do is pretty much in every country what they should. I mean, I would say they, there's nothing special about the U.S. here. You need to support uh, the average person's income. I would just do it directly. I mean, it's a little embarrassing that the Indian government, you know, which you think of as, hey, it's a developing country and a not too developed country in many respects. They got money to their nearly their whole population in just two or three days. They're using electronic means. The unemployment money in the U.S. is obviously only coming out very slowly. Some states still don't have, apparently, the system fully working. This is admittedly a problem in part that has been years building because you starved the state sector. Both Democrats and Republicans just didn't care much uh, about that, but it's obviously especially Republicans. Um, And so that, I mean, they're using very old computer systems, but I would try to get money directly to people. But you actually can't just solve this problem by handing out cash. You have a genuine production problem. In that sense, the people who said at the start that you really needed a kind of World War II model had, you didn't need to put the whole thing on a war footing, I think, but you do need to organize production. Trump was criticized quite correctly for being very slow on using the Defense Production Act. It's just ridiculous. If you look across the world, you can see that virtually every country, when it faced the decision of what to do, did two things. One is they said, we're not going to try to organize production. We're going to just stick with our whatever system we've got. Um, And then we're going to hand out most of that money through business. Both of those decisions contained important elements of mistake. I understand you don't want to turn the whole economy upside down. You don't need to have the state running all of American production. But it's insane to have, for example, the states bidding against each other for medical supplies that are in short supply. They should have, on day one, told General Motors and the other companies, you're going to make, you know, whatever you need, respirators. I mean, the the people, this could have been much better organized. You, you can see how crazy this whole system is if you look at the mask question, where we were all being told for, well, months, literally, right? Yeah, you don't need masks. They won't do anything for you. It's perfectly obvious now, I think. There was a lot of research on this. I've seen it. Masks do help. Even homemade masks work actually surprisingly well. I've had a lot of hopes that the healthcare industry um would have a strong incentive to tell the truth, and they were clearly doing that as the plague descended. There were lots and lots of healthcare workers getting sick. Um, And in that sense, uh, it didn't matter if somebody upstairs in some corporation wanted everybody back to work. The healthcare people had to sort of tell people, uh, no, you can't do that. I think that's to some extent still true. It's a little more troubling, though, as the folks in the front lines, and this is still not true everywhere, but where they have learned to protect themselves, they finally got masks, for example, and um, gowns and things like that. When they start restructuring these systems, as they often are, instead of turning the whole hospital over to coronavirus, uh, but instead to sort of put that, segregate that in a uh, infectious disease ward, Uh, then it's not so clear that folks have every incentive uh, to sort of be exactly blunt about the real risks. I mean, put simply, uh, you can see hospitals beginning to sort of complain that they can't do elective surgery, which is where they make most of their money. Um, And it may be that uh, some of these folks will be tempted. I'm sort of somebody who thinks that a lot of 
large scale businesses, which certainly include healthcare, can resist anything but temptation. This has to be watched closely in the future as this develops. Uh, I saw some uh, doctors had done a study looking at what is it that's in common between countries like Taiwan and then in Hong Kong and in Singapore. Uh, what is it in the countries that have done relatively well? And th the common factor was everybody wore masks because even if wearing a mask, as they say, protects others from you, if everyone does it, then everyone's getting protected from everyone else. No, I get it. I'm Yeah. I mean, I, it's a public good, as they would say in economics. Yeah. Um, but that should have been organized. You know, Cuomo jumped, I think, into considerable acclaim when he decided the state was going to try to commission, he was actually using prison labor, I think, um, to sort of make some masks. The, the federal government should have taken that over on day one. Uh, it didn't. The U.S. and the U.K. have both been super slow on this. Again, these are the centers where what you might call the average free enterprise sentiment in the business community is higher probably than anywhere. Um, and they've both done pretty badly on this stuff. It's pathetic and ridiculous. This is also going to have to happen as this crisis goes on. I'm assuming there won't be a quick cure found. There'll be a cure, but or one hopes, but not for a while. You will have to organize some food production and things like that. Otherwise, you get these, you can see that what the shortage economies uh, where folks are move into positions to take advantage of that, sometimes with increasing monopoly power, which is something that happens in a lot of cases like this, and I think is happening again. You know, everybody's favorite example, the toilet paper shortage. You know, how come it's so short? What's up here? Um, or, you know, you've got people pouring milk out uh, when people are looking for milk. You know, what's what's up here? That kind of stuff. This is not a case where looking for uh, the price level to fix the problem is going to work. It's failing. And it may be, in some cases, market manipulation. You're going to have to organize that. And you probably need some windfall profits taxes, too. If we look if we look at this, these two factors, science professionals are saying do not go back to work too soon, uh, this pressure to get everyone, the economy going again, and all of this. If you follow that, there needs to be a lot more money in terms of subsidizing people to be able to buy food, or we're going to be looking at starvation. Uh, there's already millions of people that have never dreamt of being in poverty are now quickly in poverty. The, no, I, I agree. The numbers. I don't. It was it 30, 40% of the second. country was living paycheck to paycheck? And now there's really no paychecks for many of them. So you put that together, the science and the need for income. How, how much subsidy can the, the feds do? How much debt can be incurred? Number one, and why, if they do need to keep subsidizing, there's still no talk about taxation. It's not like America doesn't have enough wealth to keep subsidizing. They just don't want to tax it away from the people that have it. Look, you know very well, just as I do, why no one is talking about taxation. It's because the people with all the cash are recycling parts of that money right into the political system. I mean, I don't want to be a bore. You know, I was doing political money before it was fashionable, and I don't doubt that it, uh, I'll be doing it after it's fashionable. You know, it's it's just amazing to me. I listened yesterday to a couple of technology guys talking about how, oh, we would have to do have new ideas uh, to change our economy. No, we have a political money stranglehold on U.S. policy making apparatus. We have it in Congress. We have it in the executive branch. It's even hit the court system uh, via the nomination processes. And of course, in state courts where you actually run for office, you've got to raise the money. I've written about this a million times with sometimes with my colleagues, Paul Jorgensen and G. Chen. That's why nobody is talking taxes. The U.S. government is paralyzed as it is uh, because you know, political money runs the place, not not voters. Now, let me, though, 
pick up on this theme of what do we do to get out of the a, a big depression. It's a really deadly situation here because the U.S. policy response is inadequate, just in sheer quantitative terms, and not least because the small business money, so much of it was allowed to go right off to the big business. But it's inadequate, but it's bigger than most countries. That resembles what happened in the U.S. after 2009 and 10. That's uh, because that's what happened then, too. In Europe, the size of the stimulus, except for Germany, uh, is really very small. And the European Union can't get its act together on much of anything. It's just a macroeconomic nullity, except for its central bank, which is at least uh, at the moment uh, giving countries easy money. In sharp contrast to 2009 and 10, uh, you know, China then did a big program of expansion that helped carry the rest of the world through that. Uh, I mean, you, you had a mild expansion in the U.S. and a big one in China. And that was pretty cooperatively worked out. I don't mean that people sat there and said, okay, you do this and I'll do that. Although, in fact, they had G20 meetings and think where they did say things like that. But that whole process of international economic cooperation is broken down completely. The sort of breakdown of the international political economy, the sort of increasing uh, rancor between the U.S. and China, but also between the U.S. Uh, and Europe, is very strong. So you don't have anything like a coordinated approach. Now, the reason this matters uh, is that, first of all, if you want full employment in a big country like the U.S., unless you're prepared to do it all by yourself, which nobody is, frankly, couldn't be done even if they wanted to, um, never mind talk about, you know, America first or something like that. They are not, in fact, doing anything like that. And the U.S. is less dependent on international flows of goods than most countries, but it's still heavily dependent on them. Um, you need to get back to something like world full employment. It's not possible to have the U.S. prosper and say Europe or China go completely collapse. It's not going to happen. The world's not like that. Um, but is it possible? Is it possible it's going to be the other way? I mean, is China going to be China again and even more so, given that they seem to have controlled the virus more than the United States yeah. has it? Is China going to be the locus of the world economy no. in the next? No, the, the demonization of China in the U.S. is pretty ridiculous. That said, there's plenty of problems with the Chinese regime. But more than that, I think there has been a systematic overestimation of its economic strength. I mean, this is a contentious item, but I basically think when you look at the full flow of international patents and things like that, the notion that China is coming to take over the world is not plausible at all. And Tom, give me a second here. Yeah. Is it possible that this will put even enormous pressure on China? There's already already been some, but much more, to raise the level of wages in China so that the Chinese market can consume more and not be so dependent on the American market. And I know this doesn't happen overnight. They certainly have a population big enough to do it if they're willing to democratize the economics and have less Chinese billionaires. Uh, I mean, it's obviously some of the same issues there as there are here, but they have the potential to do it. And if Chinese purchasing power goes up significantly uh, and, the, and much more reliant on their domestic market, then doesn't that change the geopolitics? Well, it would change it if they, it depends how much you think they're actually doing. I read the Belt and Road Initiative as fundamentally an older economy model, meaning the, that is in effect an effort by bluntly the older Chinese industries to sort of just do more of what they were doing in China abroad. That whole initiative, I think, has had some troubles recently. They've got the same type of debt demands, demands for debt uh, moratorium, things like that. They're facing that just as the Western countries that have been lent a lot of money in the developing world. Most of the developing world is clearly not going to be able to pay its debt. Um, and then the question is, what do you do about that? 
that question is just coming up. It's like the moon just below the horizon, but you can see the, the, the somewhat frightening light already. My take here is you're, China doesn't pull the rest of the world into a recovery this time. What always happens in such circumstances, when you're running way below world uh, full employment, is everybody is competing with each other. You see a lot of beggar thy neighbor policies, tariffs, um, currency depreciations, which <laughs> have been rampant in Asia uh, over in the last few months. I mean, the dollar tends to go up in all these crises because so much of the world's uh, money is uh, in dollars. I mean, you got Japanese banks, European banks, everybody else making dollar loans. Uh, and you know, the folks they made them to in the developing world can't pay them back. Their prices for their products are collapsing and they're hit by the COVID crisis too and can't move. You're gonna need some international cooperative solutions out of this. And and we're not likely to see that the way this is going. I'm not disagreeing. That's why my example here uh, I'm sort of with the folks who think uh, if this thing goes on, it looks more like 1932-33 than it does 2010-2011. Or in other words, I'm accepting your Great Depression scenario as quite likely. Uh, and let me add one thing to what I said about China. Uh, while I said China could do this, it's not like I'm thinking they will do this yeah, right. because the, uh, Chinese, the Chinese billionaires don't want to raise the level of wages of Chinese workers any more than the American billionaires want to yeah. do it with American workers. Yeah, but let's something like half of all the goods exported from China are by American firms. Uh, half of that trade surplus represents American firms' trade surplus in disguise. They don't seem to think through New Deal discussions, as it were. They need a New Deal, and they don't have it. I've had discussions with some of these folks. China's a complex case that demands, you know, a separate podcast in its own right, which I'm not, which I would not rush to volunteer for. But okay, let let me just ask you one question yeah. to sort of round things up. Um, if we're going into 30 style deep depression. What are the lessons of that for today? All right. The lesson I'd say is this. This is a, an area I know very well because I've worked so long on the New Deal and its period in the U.S. and many other countries. What you saw in the Great Depression after the crash, you know, the depression started in Germany in 28. Um, and then the you know the October 29 crash of course is usually taken by a lot of people mistakenly as the sort of beginning of that. Anyway, it spread around the world. In 31, uh, you saw a giant downward new a new downward leg because Europe collapsed. And you know Peter Temin and I showed some years ago the famous story about how the credit Anstalt failed, leading to a run in Germany, which led to a run in Britain is all not true. The German government would not decide it wanted out of reparations and decided not to pay and had a run uh, on that. That whole credit Anstalt story just did not have the effects that people said it did. It was internal politics in Germany that blew apart Europe at that point. That kind of stuff is happening again in Europe with a completely different, uh, in a completely different context uh, there. But after the standstill agreement on European debts in 1931, the downward leg of the depression went down again. And then there was an effort to organize a big world economic conference in London. Now, most of the folks doing that London conference were the old old thinking, doing old things, and they never probably would have failed anyway. But all hope for any kind of international uh, cooperation went down the drain. And Franklin Roosevelt just got up in the U.S. and said, OK, we have had it. We are going to just do recovery in one place. I'm not urging this as the optimal policy for the world. It's not. But you're probably going to have to, as things get worse and worse, if you can't get reasonable solutions in Europe, 
and the Chinese are just not in a position to take one on now without redistributing income. That's not going to happen any more in China than it's likely to happen in the U.S. Well, to go back to the politics of this, let's yep. say Biden wins the election, um, and Clearly, the only thing is is a Rooseveltian New Deal, a Green New Deal, a massive expenditure, public expenditure and infrastructure, assuming people can go back to work. And if they can't, massive stimulus directly until people can go back to work. But as you said earlier, the Democrats, as much as the Republicans, are beholden to finance and finance ain't going to like that plan very much. So what would you expect from a Biden administration? And and if they don't step up, then what? If they don't step up, we will uh, probably have some very fundamental political changes coming down the pike. The Obama people basically blew their chance to remake the economy in a constructive fashion. You know, they did the half-size stimulus and they got 2010 right out of that. That is to say, they immediately lost control of the House. If Biden fails to step up, you'll see another swing back to the right. Um, now, the question is, what what's Biden going to do? It's perfectly obvious that Biden is part of the Wall Street branch of the party that just basically detested uh, not only Sanders, but Warren, and really doesn't, didn't want to deal with you know, generalized medical care for all if you like, single-payer insurance for people, even though they love single-payer insurance for businesses uh, and are now implementing it on a colossal scale. This is going to be a problem. I'm not clear what happens next. I mean, the the advisors to Biden are basically the uh, Obama-Clinton types. Larry Summers is prominently mentioned. He's not the only one. They probably learned a bit. They haven't, I think, learned nearly enough they'll probably fail again. A lot's going to depend on what happens inside the Democratic Party. It's perfectly obvious that Pelosi, uh, Schumer and company really don't like uh, the left wing in, in the House, like AOC, for example, or other folks, and that the Democratic National Committee uh, has done its best to exterminate challengers, challengers to business Democrats who would prefer to really just cooperate with Republicans. At the end of 2014, early 2015, uh, that was a thing that weakened Dodd-Frank. There was a provision in there that made it possible to greatly increase the amount of money flowing into the Democratic and Republican national committees. It had bipartisan support, as you might imagine. Um, And an awful lot more money did come in. It was, I think, the background for uh, what happened in 2016, where the party just worked openly against uh, Sanders. If you're looking for an explanation of what's happened in the earlier 2020 presidential race, in particular, how that sort of vast movement uh, from Virginia on down across the South got organized against Sanders, uh, I would start looking there in the DNC. We are being strangled by political money. It's not a lack of ideas. We don't need a bunch of technological sages telling us how to sort of do weird new schemes or stuff that will make Silicon Valley even richer as the solution to our problems. Our problem is is that we are in a system of party competition in which both wings are dominated by plutocrats. It's just big money. Well, thanks very much for joining us, Tom. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Have a good one. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news podcast.